Good morning, everyone. What a sad day. After yesterday, our thoughts and prayers are with everyone affected by the train derailment in Philadelphia, especially those families who lost their loved ones. And now we are still waiting to see for the unaccounted for uh, victims as well as those who are seriously injured. Uh, we look forward to an investigation into how this happened and how it must be avoided in the future. And we must, a constant reminder that we must strengthen the confidence of, and safety in our infrastructure. Uh, and meet the, and we ha in order to have safety in infrastructure, you have to have strong infrastructure. Uh, one aspect of that uh, is the Highway Trust Fund. The Highway Trust Fund, we have, we have five legislative de days left until the Highway and Transit Trust Fund expires. 660,000 good paying jobs are at risk. 6,000 critical construction projects endangered across the country. We really have to, this issue has not in the past been a partisan issue. We've always been able to work together over time, over years, over various bills to come together uh, on our transportation and infrastructure uh, legislation. Let's hope that we can do that now. Uh, it is uh, unfortunate that yesterday in the Appropriations Committee, just with the transportation HUD uh, appropriations bill, uh, the, uh, the the that bill is 1.14 uh, below the president's budget, and in fact below FY 15, 2015, uh, a budget a, an amendment by Chaka Fatah uh, to fund Amtrak at the president's budget request was voted down. Uh, Delaro amendment to fund the positive train control, which some have said could have prevented what happened um, night before last. Um, that was the DeLauro Amendment would have funded uh, positive train control at the president's budget level, $825 million. That was voted down. And the Pas Passenger Rail Investment and Improvement Act. In 2008, we passed this bill. It was Oberstar in the House, Lautenberg in the Senate, Passenger Rail Investment and Improvement Act. You may recall it as PRIA, with all of our acronyms, and it required positive train control by December 15, 2015, this year. Uh, that um, is what they were asking for the funding so that we can help try to meet that uh, deadline. One thing I just want to say is that there are some in the Congress who are saying, oh, we've got to push that date five years farther into the future. We have to resist that we must try to get the positive train control. Uh, at that time, we had an accident in California, which resulted in many deaths of train, two trains colliding. And so this bill called for the positive train control, which could have prevented that. It is in place uh, in California at, in that location, but we need it to be every place. So that's just some of the decisions that we're making currently. Uh, that now we are wiser about the need and the urgency, and hopefully we can be bipartisan in how we come together to not only do a highway bill, but also to do a highway and infrastructure bill. And that would talk about things beyond highway, but uh, mass transit, bridges. The state of Pennsylvania, they had another accident today. No, I don't think anyone was injured. It was... Um, freight or something. But that, that state, I had the conference of mayors in yesterday, 25 mayors came by to lobby for the highway, advocate for the highway bill. And the mayors from Pennsylvania were saying that they have the highest number of bridges of any state in the country uh, that are, uh, whose security is threatened because of, you know, m no maintenance is the most expensive maintenance when it comes to uh, uh, maintaining the safety of our infrastructure. Instead of dealing with these really challenging issues, which people genuinely look to the public sector uh, to address, uh, our Republican colleagues um, 
are continuing the radical effort to dismantle a woman's right to choose uh, access to comprehensive health care. The Congress, this so far we have voted to place unprecedented restrictions on how women can spend their own money when they purchase insurance. We did that earlier this year. And we yes, uh, voted to enable D.C. employees before the last break, voted to um, enable D.C. employers to fire employees for th their reproductive health decisions, the employee or, his sp or her spouse or their dependent. Another issue before us now is the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, we take a responsibility an oath to protect and defend our Constitution, the American people. Our, that's our first responsibility, and we all stand for a strong national defense. We support lifting the sequester uh, and fully funding the president's defense budget. The, Republic bill, the Republican bill that is coming to the floor, the Def Republican Defense Authorization Bill before the House, is both bad budgeting and harmful to military planning perpetuating uncertainty and instability in the defense budget, damaging the military's ability to plan and prepare for the future. Defense Secretary Carter said last week, Republicans' approach is clearly a road to nowhere, managerially unsound, and unfairly dispiriting to our force. Republicans are trying to, end of quote, Republicans are trying to use war funding as a virtual slush fund for one part of the budget while letting the axe fall on everything else, uh, leaving priorities essential to the strength of our country. The veterans' budget, infrastructure, education, innovation, grievously underfunded. The Republican Defense Authorization Bill is not only uh, disingenuous, it is dangerous. Republicans should acknowledge that it is impossible to meet our nation with the caps that are present in the budget. We should come together with all of us, Democrats and Republicans, in a fiscally responsible way to protect our national security and grow, uh, grow our economy. The Secretary's direct quote is the Republican approach reflects a narrow way of looking at our national security one that ignores the virtual contributions made by the State Department, the Justice Department, Treasury Department, Homeland Security Department, veterans, and disregards the enduring long-term connection between our nation's security and many other factors, factors like scientific R&D to keep our technological edge, education of a future all-volunteer military force, and the general economic strength of our country, in addition to his more specific uh, description of this particular bill. Any questions? Yes, sir. Um, the Senate is about to pass uh, a legislation on currency manipulation, mm -hmm. among other trade enforcement measures. <clears throat> um, the Speaker Boehner has not expressed a whole lot of interest in this bill. First of all, what are your thoughts on currency manipulation, on trade enforcement, and what can you do to try to get this uh, actually to the President's desk? What can I do to get it to the president's desk? I think it will probably go to the president. We'll see what happens in the Senate today. I have no idea if it will pass. As the people, uh, Mr. Schumer seems optimistic about having the votes on currency manipulation. All I can say of it is, is there is concern uh, in, among member, members of the House about the currency, about currency manipulation. There has been for a very long time, and so now it is uh, the current. The concern is now manifested in the, uh, the opportunity that may present itself in this trade and these trade negotiations. The administration has been pretty uh, clear that they don't want that. My understanding is that they don't want this uh, in the bill. Uh, we keep saying, well, what other suggestions you, would you have? Because there is a general belief that currency manipulation has been uh, responsible for a loss of many jobs in our country. It is effect effectively a government subsidy that some countries have used, uh, and that's unfair in terms of trade. So it, it's there's a high level of interest. We'll see what happens in the Senate, but I don't usually predict what's going to be happening in the Senate. Well, no, I, I think 12 o'clock, are they bringing it up at noon? So um, more to say after that. 
Okay. Yes, ma'am. On the House side of it, um, obviously TPA will come to the House after it passes yeah. the Senate, but are you willing to, able to say if you think it'll pass the House at this point? A number of Democrats in your caucus are very opposed to it. Do you think TPA has a chance of passing? And do you have any news about where you yeah. stand on that legislation? The, uh, let's see what pa comes out of the ha Senate. They'll be taking up the currency, uh, the customs bill, which currency will be part, and AGOA, uh, the Africa and prefer Special Preferences Legislation 12. Then they start the debate on the other two, uh, Trade Promotion Act and the Trade Adjustment Act. We'll see what comes through the amendment process there. One major, I mean, in other words, you go back and forth on specifics and can we have any changes that might be made in the TPP, the actual bill, the Trans-Pacific uh, Trans bill, but partnership bill. But one concern that people have about the Trade Promotion Act is, of course, we would love to have seen uh, Sandy Levin's uh, substitute passed because it empowered Congress more, it had more transparency, more consultation with Congress and the rest. That was not made in order by the House Republicans. But one, uh, and, and we would have preferred that, but one overriding concern that, uh, that members have on the TPA is that this is not a TPA for the Trans-Pacific, a, a Trade Promotion Act, a fast track, just for the, the uh, Pacific bill, the TPP bill, or the European bill that will be coming up. This is a, really effectively a six-year, I don't want to say get out of jail free, but something to that effect, mm -hmm. uh, a carte blanche, uh, fast track, um, three years, with a, easily renewable for three years as a privileged resolution, the Senate giving up its 60-vote uh, requirement for a renewable in three years. So that means any and all bills that might come down the track and uh, I think that's a real reason for concern, and I wish that that part of it could be changed. Uh, because what we're saying is, well, you're asking for fast track. Let's see what you're asking for tra fast track for. And for weeks and weeks and weeks, as I think you know, we've been reviewing the TPP to the extent that it is uh, finished. You know, some parts of it aren't, they tell us. But we've been drilling down on currency manipulation, dispute resolution, food sanitation, ec uh, environmental concerns, workers' rights. The list goes on and on substantively. And so people are saying, well, I'll give you fast track if I think that I might vote for TP, you know, depending on what it's for. But this fast track is for things unknown, and I would hope that there could be some uh, addressing of the length of time and the open season uh, that it gives for any trade agreement, not related to the substance of the, any agreement that we see on the horizon, but anything that might come along. So uh, I, when I had the majority, when I was the speaker, you used to always write that every vote was a test of my leadership. No matter what it was, it was a test of my leadership. So now this will be a test of the speaker's leadership as to whether uh, he can produce the votes for a bill that the Republicans support. I think we only have time for maybe one or two more questions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, have you spoken with the White House about your desire to have a shorter uh, time frame for the uh, TTA? And what have they said, if you have? Well, we, uh, we have a number of concerns that members have. Again, food senators, I, I listed some of them. And what I'm going to do today is really to see what responses we have received back on some of the concerns that have been mentioned, whether um, that was really part of what the, the Levin uh, uh, substitute put forth. They obviously are supporting the bill as it is going to the floor in the Senate. That might be a response. Yeah, yes. I'm just shifting gears to foreign policy quickly. Mm -hmm. As you know, the president is hosting a summit at Camp David yes. with some GCC nations. Uh, the head of state for Saudi Arabia and other nations declined to participate. What do you think that says about our current relationships with such strategic Middle East allies? I don't think Saudi Arabia declined to participate. The head of state did, but they are sending representation 
uh, to, for whatever reason, uh, the king will not be coming, but they will have high-level participation uh, in the meeting. I think that uh, this is a new idea to bring everyone here. I commend the president for his leadership in doing it, and it is, uh, uh, it, it's innovative, and some people are not inter uh, uh, attuned yet to that innovation. But uh, I think this president deserves a great deal of credit on foreign policy. Uh, of course, one of the issues on the agenda, I believe, I haven't been told, but from what I read in the daily metropolitan journals at our disposal here, is that, uh, that the Iran agreement would be uh, an issue of discussion there. And uh, this president deserves a great deal of credit. Uh, the very idea that, well, it, some of it probably started under President Bush and has continued the idea of reaching out for an agreement with Iran. But this president, uh, under his leadership, uh, to have the P5, Russia, China, the United States, the UK, and France, plus one, Germany, in agreement for a long period of time over, uh, over sanctions, over uh, the, the uh, terms of the negotiation is almost miraculous. Uh, this is a very big deal. I won't go into the years that I have been trying to get China, Russia, even France to stop transferring dual technologies to Iran, two decades at least. But in any event, I see this as a very major accomplishment. And uh, obviously the goal is that Iran will not have a nuclear weapon and we have to exhaust every diplomatic remedy to make sure that happens. Uh, so I think the president brings a high, a strong hand to the table in, uh, in um, at Camp, is it at Camp David? Did they decide, just, I, I can't keep up with everybody's locations, but uh, uh, at the table in Camp David in terms of bringing p countries together to act severally in terms of uh, having leverage in, in negotiation with Iran. So I, I, I wish him well. It, it, it's a discussion. It's not a, it's not a lecture. So they will have a conversation among them and exchange views, and I think that is a very good thing for them to do. You had another question? Oh, no, no, no fair, no fair. It was a follow-up. On Amtrak, actually. Oh, oh. I mean, Amtrak got $1.3 billion from the stimulus bill. Um, I mean, is there really an excuse for under for for underinvestment in the Northeast Corridor if you have such a huge infusion that you helped, helped yeah. get for Amtrak? Of well, I think that, obviously, the, the, these needs are big. And uh, some of the, you know, I, I, I don't know. You're going to have to ask others because I just don't know why. But the Republicans have been very much against Amtrak for a very long time. Uh, I remember when Secretary Thompson came to be head of HHS, uh, Secretary of HHS, uh, former governor of Wisconsin. You remember when he came? Well, he really loved Amtrak, and I think that was where his heart was and was hoping that he could play a leadership role there. I mean, that's kind of what he told us. And, but they put him at HHS, which he loved as well. But uh, he was sort of an exception among the Republicans in terms of strong supporter of Amtrak. Uh, the, uh, in the history of our country, if you go back and read about Henry Clay when he was speaker, the issue of infrastructure was controversial in our country then. More than you may want to hear about this morning because we have to go, but you know when Jefferson was president, he had it, an initiative for building the infrastructure of our country. Part of it was the Lewis and Clark expedition to explore the Cumberland Road, Erie Canal, all of that. And uh, it's, it's very exciting. And 100 years later to celebrate, they, they established the National Park Service as in preservation of our infrastructure and the rest in another manifestation of infrastructure. <clears throat> but even going back over 200 years, there was dispute because the Southerners didn't want to support infrastructure if it looked like most of those projects were going to be in the North, even though I'm not saying strictly Northeast at that point, but in the North. And so there's been a regional debate historically in our country on the subject. But that was 
sort of ancient. You saw President Eisenhower at a time of tough economic times have the interstate highway uh, system put forth. It was a defense mechanism to unify America. So this is about our economy. It's about our safety. It's about um, uh, quality of life, clean air. It is, it's, a, it's so important for us to do. And one manifestation of that infrastructure, which does all of those things, is a mass transit, is a mass transit, is a Amtrak. One manifestation is Amtrak. People to and from work, saving time, quality of life, cleaning the air, and the rest. And for some reason, it has just been uh, opposed by some not all, by some in the Republican Party. So in any case, uh, we have the speaker coming in in 10 minutes, so I have to give up this room. Uh, call me if you have a question, and <laughs> I'll see you next week. <laughs> if not, are we here next week? We're so here and so infrequently. But this is a big deal, and I'm hoping that we can work together with the speaker, uh, as we have done uh, recently on past issues, uh, to uh, restore the bipartisanship in the broader question of transportation and infrastructure uh, because it is that's we have to meet the needs of the American people it affects every aspect of their lives the economy of our country the safety of our people thank you all very much